Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Coriolis Rules by Free League Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. Strong language, powerful factions, and adventures across the third horizon await. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Michael, and we are opening our Children of the Periphery campaign season one, and we have so much to get to. Before the top of the show, I'd like to thank you, the listener, and especially you, the Patreon supporter, as you have helped support us through all of the years and all of the different shows. If you'd like to check out what we have to offer, you can at patreon.com slash the Old Ways Podcast. And now, cast introductions to my right. This is Morgan. I go by she, her, and I'm playing Amara Kasra, also she, her, and I'm really looking forward to this journey. As am I, to Morgan's right. Hi, this is Allie, she, her, my character's pronouns are also she, her, and I am playing Kainat Gala, who has obtained some interesting things already. Mm, Indeed. At the proverbial end of the table. Hi, I'm John. Pronouns are he, him. My character... Fida is also he, him. He's a mechanic who's in a good position right now. Hmm. I think that's one way to put it. It's definitely a way to put it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to John's right. Hi, this is Rena. My pronouns are they, them, and I am playing Tamarisk and Vari, also they, them. And I'm musing on the fact that in space, no one can hear you scream. After the last, the last time we, we saw you on camera, it's probably a very good idea. And last, but most certainly not least... Hello, I am Rosie, she, her of Odd Duck Dice, the gender of which shall be nebulous forever. Today, I am playing Icarus, also she, her, the pilot of our crew, and hopefully her circumstances improve. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Last time we saw Icarus on camera, not, we'll just say not the most beneficial position you'd been placed into. So yeah, as you will notice here on the Old Ways podcast, the campaign kickoff includes uh, the inclusion of pronouns, which we think are super important. And as a reminder, your storyteller is always he, him. And so now we'll raise the curtain. In some way, shape or form, all of you have been brought, tasked, traveled to a very important place. That important place is an enormous structure called the monolith on Kua. Kua, the beautiful planet which Coriolis Station orbits. This monolith is not just a simple building, clearly. It towers above every structure nearby. In fact, every structure in the Third Horizon, by comparison. It is known to be a place of wealth, a place of power, especially Zenithian power, and a place where those whom choose what becomes of society live. Many of these power brokers and their like are called patrons. These patrons can take on many different shapes, purposes, and by and large, most hold the Zenithian lifestyle in high regard. And that is because they are the wave of the future. Not all pure technocrats, although that is perhaps one way the first come would see them. Most Zenithians here that live and work around the monolith believe in the Zenithian ideal. And that is repeated and echoed in many different ways, not just in the structures, but in the way people live here. And that is that everyone is Zenithian. Everyone. Period. For you all, In this communal space that you are soon to share, you have been kept in, at least for the most part, in quiet comfort inside a oval-shaped room. There's a large oval-shaped table. There are several chairs. Your position, height in the monolith, gives a beautiful view of Kua. 
for some of you, looking down might be very uh, provocative. We'll just say that. This is likely some of the richest splendor you have been uh, exposed to. Even those of you who are, uh, we'll just say, socially apt. The touches here, the different pieces of art that exist in this oval room are exceptional. And yet, seemingly placed commonly. There is not one piece of art, sculpture or painting that dominates the structure or this space. There are several. Whomever cultivates this, those of you who have, um, I will just say an eye and ear for culture, you'd be able to quickly make out that there is not but one or two grandiose pieces, but several. And you wait for what's to come, but perhaps not in silence. All of you know, at least in some regard, who waits behind the door, the patron coming, Leo Marhoon. Put in that quiet space that you have in the Oval Room for now. I wonder who amongst you first is to talk. I'm playing with the token that was given to me on the station. And I look at the others in the room. What are you guys all here for? Flight has just been pacing up and down the room in his big work boots. And he's just like, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. So do us a favor if you would, Fida. And perhaps our um, once and future captain as well. Give us some visuals on the people that you see. The people who are attached to these voices. Amara? She stands about 5'6". She's slender, but athletic looking. She is wearing a long brown leather duster that she replaced after losing her other one on Coriolis. <laughs> and other pants with a white fitted shirt underneath. I have short chin length, dark brown hair, maybe a little wavy. Um, I have gray eyes, high cheekbones, olive colored skin. You can't see, but I have several tattoos underneath my duster. I'm looking anxiously around the room to see what, you know, what other people might be here for, because I, I know why I was called. Fighter, the guy that responded, is a big slab of a man who's six-something, broad in shoulder, broad in waist, big bear arms, B-A-R-E, not B-E-A-R, with hands that have clearly known a lot of hard work. His forearms are covered in intricate, abstract tattoos that are meshed closely together in, in shifting patterns and repeating styles. He's got this huge mane of hair that's going up behind him. You can see he's got some piercings. He's got a face that looks like this guy has seen some tough living, might be the best way to put it. It's kind of pale, like a lot of station-born folks. He's not ghost pale, he's just normal pale. There's still color tint. He's not just a sheet. And he is pacing up and down this room, getting on everybody's last nerve in heavy dock worker boots for as long as he's been here. He kind of wishes that he had a rectangular room so that there was more just one wall he could walk up and down instead of this curve. But yeah, that's Fida. Amara would be standing as well with her arms crossed back against the wall so she can see the entire room. She's not the most trusting person right off the bat. She looks at Fida and everything okay? Lady, I was doing a routine job and it just went a little bit wrong. And then a lady turned into energy and wasn't in the room anymore. So, I mean, it just went a little bit wrong. But also... People don't usually turn into energy, so I'm still kind of trying to puzzle that one out. Well, I, it sounds a lot like what happened to me, minus the whole lady turning into energy thing. I I didn't have that happen, but I mean... Uh, that's what I thought you were going to talk about, and I was like, wow, what a coincidence, two people in one room. Well, my name's Amara. Fida. Hmm. I extend a hand and strongly try to, you know, shake it. <laughs> Yeah, he comes over and, like, his huge paw just kind of envelops yours. But he doesn't apply any pressure. He's just got really big hands. Yeah, they're, they're quite meaty. Can't be helped. Sounds like you've had quite a dramatic time of things here from behind you. 
Tamarisk has been wandering around, fanning themselves a little bit with a very ornate looking fan, looking at the view, looking at the art, just enjoying things quietly, other than the sound of the very heavy work boots clunk, 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 clunking across the floor. But Tamarisk is about six feet. They have light brown skin, very, very dark eyes, long, dark hair, cheekbones, and a jawline that could cut through glass more than likely. Uh, wearing trousers, like loose sort of blue trousers with a tunic knee length over it in purple with gold stitched through it, tall boots. And then they've got this just ornate fan that they've been, even though it's not warm in here, just sort of casually fanning themselves with as they walk around looking at things. But they've got a very charming smile and they, they, there's no malice or ill intent in, in their comments. they just observing you. Guess you call it that. It goes back to pacing. I do, do love a man of very concise answers. Try not to tread a track in the floor, darling. He just kind of like looks over. It's a look that says by the icons without the words being said. And he just goes back to his pacing. Yeah, I I look over at at them and say, "What are you in for, darling?" Oh, a good time, I hope. <laughs> I think you're in the wrong area for that, or maybe the very right area. Well, I'm not quite sure. I was told there'd be something of interest to me here. Was not sure what to expect, and just looking around at everybody in the room. Interesting crowd. I'm Tamarisk, by the way. Pleasure to meet you. I extend my hand. Amara. I do hope we find out what it is we're dealing with sooner rather than later before the floor that probably costs more than uh, your acquaintance here will ever learn in his entire life is damaged by those delightful heavy work boots. If he actually made a hole in the floor, we'd be closer to getting to the actual fun parts of town, in, in my personal opinion. But, and then she goes back to looking out the window. Icarus is a woman somewhere in her mid 20s. She would be tall, except she holds herself tucked in. Like she's trying not to take up space. Her skin is tanned as though from a fair amount of outdoor living. If you were to ever shake her hand, you'd realize that it's got some cuts and calluses. Right now it's flicking a lighter on, off, on, off. And she's wearing a dark blue flight suit with a lot of random pockets that look like they've been sewn on as she needs them. A lot of color on a dark backdrop. She has short hair that's been pushed back from her face and her attitude is a lot like a bird ready to take flight. And she looks very nervous. And even as she's speaking, She's much more focused on looking out the window up at the sky than at any of you. I'd look over at Icarus and say, I like your outfit. Thanks, Icarus. Mm, Amara. Hi, Amara. And there's Theta or is it Fida? He just like pauses and as he's walking and he's just like, Fida. Fida. And fancy pants. That's mix fancy pants to you. Thank you. Are there like crates or anything in here? Mm -mm, no. Do you know what? The, you know what's in here? Art, as pre mentioned before. There's a big oval table. There are some chairs, and there are some very tall and somewhat narrow windows that one can look out. That's that's about it. Some some lighting that's done diffused through sconces. A set of doors opposite the table that's about it no crates nothing that should not be in here everything is placed with purpose so i'm going to be sitting at the table with the backpack that i keep on hand like rummaging in it mm -hmm. i'm rearranging everything so that it sits better on my back but also so that it's more organized because after the adventure i had it kind of got jumbled once i just shoved some stuff into it Mm, indeed. Well, whatever we're doing, we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us, as long as you all are prepared for that. Well, as long as we're making burr, I am up for anything. So, Kynot is clothed basically from the top down. It's 
a soft, like silver, soft gray color. And it has a pattern that is something akin to what armor would look like, just over the clothing for decoration. And not that anyone can see it, but there's some darker blonde hair that's tucked into the hood. And she has these like darker green eyes that from a distance look brown and some fairly angular cheekbones. And she's just sitting with this backpack hanging out. Yeah. What's your name? I'm going to look up for my backpack and raise a hand. Kai not. Yeah, and, and what do you do? I do a lot of things, but primarily I study what mysteries exist in the dark. Fascinating. So like nothing on a ship? I can run all of the science stuff on a ship. Oh, oh you're one of those. Okay. Amara. That's my name. My name's Amara. And what do you do for the ship? Oh, I don't know yet. I haven't been told. I was just told to come here. But I can do all sorts of things. I'm really good at talking, if you haven't noticed. Perhaps you'll be a, a diplomat on the ship. Yes, you're very good at it. Chatting with people. I don't know if they want me diplomating anything. Fida, you notice the illumination in the room picks up by 5%. It suddenly gets brighter. It's something subtle. And it's something that Icarus would probably notice, but given that she's staring out the windows down at what is effectively home, the glow from the ambient light there is probably just not going to be something that she'd pick up. There is a soft and likely all too pleasant door chime that goes off. It's a peaceful tone in G. As he notices the lights have brightened, he just stops and turns towards the door. Doesn't say anything to anybody, just turns and faces it because he knows something is coming. Has a feeling he knows what, too. With a very smooth motion, the door parts. And a new person walks through the door. They are probably just under six feet tall. Blonde hair woven into a braid pattern that exists down the center of their neck and back. They are dressed and fitted in, you don't want to say a military uniform, but there is some uniformity to it. It's purpose cut and built jacket and slacks. And they wear what look like fairly expensive shoes. There's no tie, but there is a, I guess the, the best term would be likely ascot or handkerchief that sits between the shirt and that sort of jacket they wear over it, which is a beautiful, deep olive color. And behind them, there are two very large suits of armor that walk through the door, too. So those of you in the know, which would likely be most of you, these two look like legionnaires. So they are, in effect, space marines. They're not holding any weapons, but most of you also know that they don't need to. The power armor speaks for itself. Most times. Especially against an unarmed, unarmored target. Uh-huh. Fai's been seeing a lot of these guys since we last saw him. So he's just like, yeah, not worth the trouble. Don't try anything. The figure in front steps forward. The two space marine suits step to the left and to the right, respectively, as the door is shut. And she stops. This, this figure stops for a moment and looks around the room, almost with like a, a, an eager grin. It's so good to see you all. Would you uh, care to take a seat? I think I'll stand. Oh, please, not on my behalf, Captain. Sit. Icarus closes her lighter. There's a bit of a snap when she does it, like a little bit final. And she addresses the blonde woman and asks, were you the one that paid my bounty? Yes. Thank you. Can I go now? No. Why? We'll talk about it. Do I have to? Yes. She glances at the legionnaires. She says, have either of you ever arrested me before? You see almost a brightness, a flush to the flesh in this woman's face. 
almost like she's pleased in a sort of strange way. And she just consumes the potential air in the room. Oh, they won't. They won't speak to you. That's not the way this works. They work for me. They don't do anything unless I ask. Please. She gestures again to the table. At this point, Icarus will sit and she's taken her lighter back out. She hasn't like opened it and started flicking it yet, but it's definitely making passes through her fingers, almost like a, a coin might with a practiced con man. Fighter just lets out a grunt and is going to sit down and just goes over, pulls out a chair and just doesn't throw himself into it because he doesn't entirely trust things that aren't, you know, shop fabricated to uh, take his weight. Yeah, Mara will sit down as well, reluctantly, but facing the legionnaires with her hand on her dagger that is holstered to her side. Tamaris gives a slight bow from the shoulders. This thank you for your hospitality and takes a seat. Certainly. Now, we all have a lot to talk about. For some of you, I had the opportunity to assist you in making sure that your life was something more than the inside of a jail cell. For others, I had the opportunity to expand, well, your reach. I have the ability to give you such potential in our horizon. Opportunity. Opportunity to erase debts, to build a reputation, to build a future. And so I brought you all here as some of you, invitation, others just because fate brought you to me. No matter what the icons have chosen for you in the past, we are going to forge a new road ahead, a future, one which will allow you to use your experience and abilities in the best way possible. As some of you might be aware, I'm Leah Marhoon, Zenithian patron. I work for the Trade Federation by requirement. She sort of twinkles a smile at you. But that doesn't mean that I don't have other interests. I have many interests. And I'm hoping that you'll find this intriguing enough to sign on for. And I say that in all earnestness. If this isn't something you're interested in, I'll afford you the ability to walk out the door and then choose whatever life you think is best. Some of you with perhaps a few financial concerns might find this very interesting. I have recently opened up an exploratory slot in my patronage for a group of five to work some very far-flung archaeological sites. These sites are filled with all sorts of potential cultural importance. They are in distant places. It will require a sharp pilot, a experienced captain. It will require someone whom can speak to different culturals and to massage their way through difficult situations. It will take an earnest scientific mind, one who has clearly investigated these things before, and that crew will need a dedicated engineer to keeping their new ship in one piece. I believe that I have all five of those people here, and I'm certain the icons will bless this new accord that we will forge. In exchange for your service, I will provide you a fantastic ship, one which has creature comforts and is also, well, has a bit of a style all its own. I think that's the best way to say it. And all I require is your agreement. And in such, perhaps a small first opportunity together. Something you'll collect from me. But beyond that, I want to make sure that you're prepared to enter the agreement. And so if you have any questions for me, now is the time to ask. What sort of exploration do you have in mind? I have some interests on one of the trade channels. There's a trade route that exists that I am looking for a group to go and work 
a site. That site is on Menkar. Menkar is quite a far way away. I won't bother with dice rolls. Menkar is at the end of the Sandal route. It's one of the furthest flung systems in the Third Horizon. Yeah, Amara's um, intimately familiar with Menkar, and so she will look at Rahun. You know that's where my parents died. I do. She says it matter-of-factly. And they they died. My mother was an archaeologist. Captain, we all die. But we don't know how they died. And they died on that planet. So now you're sending us there. The, the pay better be good. Um, certainly. Of no question. And we won't send you there first. Again, there's a small little item I need you to take care of as a group before you go there. Menkar will come. I take that as your acceptance, then? Will we have the resources to investigate what happened to my parents? I think that you will have time to invest. Time as a resource as well. And so, provided you and your pilot can get you to Menkar in time, and if it's a, a fastly plotted route, perhaps you will have extra time to investigate what happened to your parents. Then I'm in. Excellent. Sounds like a good time to me. I'm in. I've heard you enjoy good times. Goes with the territory. Charming smile. That's two. Who's next? Oh, I'm happy to go. I thought you might be. It's rumored that Menkar holds secrets from the portal builders. Secrets still unearthed. Ones which might shed light as to what these portal builders were up to before we arrived. That's three. Fight his size, he's just like, and the pay for this job will be enough to uh, put me towards squaring what I owe. Oh, debts. They are part of life. I would say that your work through me will do two things. It will give you a sustainable uh, subsistence, which to operate on. And given my talents here, as a member of the Trade Federations, I'll be able to keep the dogs at bay from your bills. Because after all, with you under my wing of protection, they would have to come after me to get to you. All right, I'm in. I assume, said Imarhun, that I am in your debt, and as such, I don't really have a choice. I think choice is something that's very important. What you choose to do with your choice is very important. It will show whether you're truly committed to this task. City, I'm going to ask you some questions about how I got here because you're probably the only person that I'll actually meet in the near future that might answer them. Do you know if my friend Dante sent me up or was pressured into doing so to save his own ass? You know what's interesting about your friend Dante? He's Dante. He's my friend Dante, too. My condolences, City. No, no. No, no. No condolences necessary. Dante was placed for a reason, as are many people by me in different areas of Kua to look for people of talent, to cultivate relationships, friendships with them. So that way, when their patron calls... They can have suggestions. Now, Dante, of course, as you well know, doesn't always like to keep to the common order of how jobs are supposed to go. He's a little flighty, right? So he needed to provide me something quick, and he did so. A fantastic pilot. I'm very certain that you'll be able to get your crew to the places that you need quickly. City, there's no one faster, so... Yes, I, I will get them where you need them to go. And next time you see Dante, may I ask that you slap him? Well then, since we have an accord, I suppose this is all that's left. She steps forward and she produces a small pad. And she sets it in front of you, Amara. I pick it up. Enclosed is a outline of a business agreement. In effect, reading through the lines that are here, it sets out terms for job expectations, pay, and then pay versus what something is called the main asset. That's all it's referred to as. 
I glanced at the contract. Point out that line on the uh, the contract. And what does this mean? The main asset. Oh, the ship, of course. Any contractual crew with me has the opportunity to, as they earn, work to own the ship that they'll use. Is there a price on, on the pad for how much the ship is? Yeah, absolutely. Is this a requirement as part of your contract that we have to work to own the ship? Absolutely. I look at the price. Well, this is more like enslavement versus a partnership. Well, that's one way to put it, certainly dependent upon your perspective. The other way to look at it would be to think of the opportunity to own a vessel which comes from a shipyard, which more often than not builds state-of-the-art military technology. You're in the business of trade, Captain. You need an asset which can do the same Are we allowed to work extra jobs that aren't under your purview? How you choose to pay the bill that you owe me every month for it is completely up to you. Every month? Well, certainly. Just like any agreement that you would make with a accommodation, perhaps any sort of vehicle that you would use. If you're not going to pay for it immediately, you would pay over terms. These are the, the terms of the contract. We can haggle over it if you'd like, but you'll lose. What's that haggling then? This is the crew you're giving me? She sort of stands up a little bit, a little bit straighter. This is the crew that you'll work with. Giving them to you as if you own them might be a little, well, let's just say I'd I'd prefer that they give you their permission first. I don't mean that I own them, that they are. This is the crew. Best you could find. Yes, this is the crew. Okay. All right. I stand up and clap my hands and say, let's do this. Do you need me to sign something? Mm, Just your acknowledgement, yes. All right. I sign my acknowledgement. I throw the pad down on the table and walk out of the room. Wait, I mean, wait. Do we have our first job? No, that comes after the contract signing. No, I'm going to stick around then. Probably a sound plan. So I'll just ask, do do all the, the rest of the characters in turn sign up? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I read the whole thing carefully first, and then I sign it. Yes. Yeah, so the terms of the contract are fairly, we'll just say one-sided. It's not to be unexpected, obviously. The ship cost overall of 1.8 million burr is a doozy to see that amount. But that said, you know, it could be worse. You sort of shrug. It's really... You know, you're going to have to generate something like 150,000 burr per year. So that's that's something. But she's left the opening for you to do other jobs. And you do note very um, wisely here, Tamaris, that there is no for there's no penalty for early payment. So if you pay the vessel off, there's no penalty for it, which is quite frankly, uh, you don't think it's an oversight, perhaps. You actually think it's more likely that Marhoon is trying to encourage you to take more jobs. So after the crew signs, she taps a bar here on the oval table and a holographic display kicks up of Coriolis Station. You are going to head back to Coriolis Station for me and retrieve some sensitive data that is in, let's just say, the not, not the nicest of places on that station. In the aqueduct of Zakara, in the cellar, there is a cistern which has been rumored to have become a, well, something of a place for libations for some of the smugglers that exist in the net around Coriolis. There is a man named Moab who has a information disc he's unwilling to give up. I need it. It does not matter to me how you obtain it, whether that be financial, sexual, theft. I need it. And I need it in the next 12 hours. Obtain it and bring it back to me here. It is your key to unlocking the ship. Once you have that, you'll be on your way to your first official job. Understood? I just nod. Do you have an image of this fella? Oh, yes. I'll provide you a picture of him, certainly. She flashes it up on screen. He's a middle-aged salt and pepper 
sort of dark olive skinned man. Looks like he wears some sort of either flight suit or captain's jacket of sorts. He has a thick beard, which runs down to probably his Adam's apple. And then he has a couple of what look like brass or bronzed earrings in his left ear. He has a pockmarked face as well. So there's definitely some some scarring there. Do you have any dirt on them that we can use? He's a well-known smuggler in and out of the net. And if, well, let's just say if any of the plaza guards or Coriolis guards were to get a good look and find on him, it's very likely that he would be incarcerated for many crimes. Mostly smuggling. Wouldn't we all? Not me. Definitely not. Look over it. Tamarisk. Really? That hover bike, is that yours? Can I say goodbye to it? Yes, I do own the bike. It's a prototype. It's very impressive. The ghost is just that. You can certainly see it on your way out. She sort of puts her hands together and bows her head in like a little thanks. Transportation back to Coriolis will be provided to get you there swiftly. If there is anything else that you need, equipment, or, well, clothing, perhaps, for some of you, we're happy to provide. Clothing? I look down at myself. Oh, not for you, Captain. I was thinking more of, well, someone who might not want to get their clothes dirty. I suppose. A little laugh. Splendid. The guards will see you out. Icarus, if you'd follow me. Icarus does so. So the rest of you get led to a fairly close elevator, which rapidly takes you down about 10 floors. And you get out in something that you recognize, Fido, which is basically the common area right outside a hangar. You can see through the glass here that there's a probably 200 by 400 foot hangar that opens right out to the side of the monolith. There's an, a collection of vessels there. And there's people working, just every old common day engineers, just doing the things that they would, that you would probably be doing on a regular day, refueling things, doing maintenance checks, that sort of thing. I can tell what each one's doing at a glance. Just, yeah, he's doing refueling. He's replacing something down in the landing gear. He's doing, etc. She's doing this, then the other, and that person over there is doing this. Right. Don't say it out loud, but, you know, just notice what everybody's doing. The vessels here range, too, from size and shape. But there is one that is at the back of the hangar there that immediately catches your eye. It's impossible to miss that vessel. It's like a gray and, and black painted vessel. You can tell that it's been painted that specific. There's a little bit of a gloss, like a sheen to the color. That is quite a ship. Yeah, and the black and gray makes me think about what I just heard about a ship from a military yard. And he's just kind of like, yeah, I could see myself working on that. He's just getting the measure of all the ships in here. And he's just, that one really, he's kind of estimating as he looks at it. Yeah, and he has stopped walking. He's just like, measurements. He's just going off of it, what he can see from the outside. And he's like, not the fastest, not the biggest, but pretty. It's something. It is not standard. Bingo. That last sort of thought that you have that comes forward is that's not in any sort of normal ship design. I mean, it is, but yet it isn't. It would stick out. There's clearly custom components and fitting bits that you're that just aren't standard, or you, they are, but you wouldn't see them together. So yeah, he's pretty impressed by what he's seen over there, and he's really hoping that's the one. So now it's just a case of go up, do this job, and uh, don't get killed. So for your part, Icarus, you're brought to a different section of this part of the monolith. You too take an elevator down, but it's into a different section. You can hear the ambient pressure has changed in this part of the monolith, or wherever you're at, whether that's part of the patron's residence. But there does seem to be a small smaller mechanics bay where more ground vehicles are being looked at or prepared. And then right to the left of when you walk in, the ghost just sits there. And 
its presence is so loud that it takes up all your thoughts as soon as you see it. She walks over and just any movie that you've ever seen where there's like a lover's goodbye, that's the energy that she's got towards this bike. And she just sort of runs her hand over the top of it. And then she looks back at Leah, says, all you really had to do was ask, just ask next time. The the whole running and thinking me, my best friend, were going to die, that was unnecessary. I don't know if you understand how patrons work. I don't really care. Where I'm from, life is precious but cheap. You don't know how many friends I've lost in monsoons or to different predators. That the nicest thing you can ever do is actually ask permission. Anyone else takes. From my perspective up here, I think life works a little differently. Try rocking on the ground. Might care a little bit. And she kisses the bike goodbye and then, okay, ready. You get led to the rest of the group through a couple of doors into the larger hangar. Leah splits off from you and heads upstairs into a a secondary lift that goes back up. So the rest of the group sees Icarus rejoin them. You are all directed to a transport ship that you get inside of. And after some fairly quick pre-flight checks, you're very quickly zoomed out of the bay. I will add, though, much like Fida noticed that ship at the back of the hangar, that is something that you see as well, Icarus. There's a ship all the way in the back, and it can't hide even if it tried. And interestingly enough, the same type of gloss paint pattern that the ghost has is the same type of pattern that's on that ship. Okay, that's actually important because if our patron owns that bike and that's her style, that's promising. You're whisked off the monolith. You can sort of feel the engines kick up high as you begin to elevate higher and higher into the atmosphere. The bindings that are attached to your arms and to your shoulders to keep you in these jump seats without uh, scrambling your internal organs uh, stress a little bit. The pilot's not overcompensating by any means, but they are looking to get away from the monolith and into the stars relatively quickly. This is something that would not in any way, shape or form surprise you, Icarus, as the Free League is known to occasionally take shots at vehicles that depart the monolith as sort of a universal middle finger to the people who live there. But so far, no rocketry impact or alarms at this point. And then a minute or two afterward, you feel the transition from atmosphere to space and you can hear and feel the ship's dampers kick in. So that way it begins to sort of generate its own localized gravitic fields. It's a little imperfect. So for those of you still sitting or eventually getting up and walking around, you can feel a little bit of a, almost like a wave pool wash to some of your movements. To you, Fida, that sounds like something needs to be checked. It's always something with these ships. I mean, they'll always do it after the next run or at the end of the season. But then there's just one more job and then bam, down she goes. From there, the group gets pointed towards the net. And that is those uh, that larger superstructure that exists outside Coriolis, made up of one of the former seed ships that came to the Third Horizon. And you basically get slotted in, so that way you can get projected towards a landing area. This is something for you, Amara, that you've probably seen and done a dozen times. This is just part of it. Unfortunately, you also know that you have a clock ticking. Yep. 12 hours is not a long time to manipulate somebody and make them give us an information chip. And the clock is ticking. The crew is going to end up landing in the Ozone Plaza. So the Ozone Plaza is attached to basically the largest technological and sort of gizmos marketplaces of Coriolis. But one thing that does sort of 
probably pique your interest here, Tamarisk, is that the Ozone Plaza is the one plaza that the legions protect rather than the Coriolis Station guards. So it doesn't really surprise you that you would end up docking here, given where your patron and her alliances sit. So when you get off the ship and on to Coriolis, you see a collection of legionnaires hanging out in some of these pockets where people, you know, these airlocks where people depart and get onto the more promenade style portion of the plaza. A lot of people stuffed in space marine armor that are strapped with rifles and high powered weapons that keep the peace by any means. So where's the crew going? Fida turns turns to a man. He's like, so, uh, Captain, you know where this place is? Gunned in? Or were you, like, were you one of those captains? What does one of those captains mean? If we're going to a smuggler's den, it means a fucking smuggler, dum-dum. Don't talk to your fucking captain like that, Jesus. Storyteller, given Icarus's profession, does she have any idea? You didn't spend a lot of time on Coriolis Station. Not that you've never been there, but you've spent most of your time on Kua doing all sorts of, um, we'll just say, things. Fun runs. Right, funs. You've had a considerable amount of fun on Kua, and now you're expanding. That's what you're trying to think of it as, maybe. So the seller doesn't bring up a ton of really great adjectives. Really, other than the sort of plebeians who do maintenance on the station's life support system, and then members of the Coriolis Guard who might be on what we call purge patrols to purge smugglers. No one really visits the cellars of Coriolis. Where would I find those people? I'm assuming there's a bar or somewhere seedy. Oh, sure. Well, there's plenty. I go to half of them. Not because I'm seedy, because people my friend friends with there. Is it in the Spice Plaza? It's not actually. Mm-mm. It's it's below everything, actually. That's why it's called the cellar. So what I'll do is I'll ask for perhaps our first role, which I think should be a culture role. And then I will give you some information. What do you want rolling? Everybody? Well, I assume that you're all in somewhat vested interest in it. I don't know that Kynot is exactly keyed in on that, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't keep them from rolling culture. Not so much this particular culture. Right. And then with my like, empathy of four, I got one success. Okay. I also got one success. Is that just culture? No, it's the um, attribute attached to it as well. Okay. I have two successes. You are way more cultured than me. No idea what, my darling. Don't worry. I, I am not cultured in this particular culture because I got zero successes. That's okay. So all you need is one for the base knowledge. And realistically, as far as the seller goes, it's a place that no one goes for a certain reason, right? There are no easy pathways down there. It's a restricted area. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways to get down there. There are ways through different mediums. So if you had a contact in the syndicate, you might be able to pay your way to get, basically get them to open the hatches so you can get down there. If you're perhaps a little knowledgeable in the gambling circuit or have friends in those spaces, you might be able to get directions down there. It's rumored that the student district has a method of getting down there for some of their more wild parties that take place in underground spaces. And then if you perhaps had the money to grease the palms of some of the Coriolis station guard, clearly they would have a way to get down there because they do patrols, purge patrols. So, is there any maintenance folks around out, out in the open? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I'll, I'll walk up to one of them. Hey, buddy. Man in a maintenance uniform looks up at you. Want to make a couple burr? For? Information. He looks around a little bit. He looks over at the, you know, small pack of legionnaires that's 30 or 40 feet away. He steps closer to you. What do you want? What do you need? Looking to get to the cellar. His eyes go really wide. You don't want to go down there. No, but I do. I have things to do. Listen, you'd be better off maybe asking somebody in some of the gambling dens around here. They might know. I'm not interested in getting in trouble for giving somebody directions. I'll make it worth your while. How? 
How does 20 burr sound? Okay, so I'm going to give you a little knowledge out of game, Morgan. He probably makes at least 20 to 30 burr an hour. He's going to want so much more than that. Probably. What we could do instead is take his advice and say, okay, bye-bye, and go look for someone slinging cash around. I'm going to go to a terminal, and I'm going to see if I can find Yara. Okay. My old drinking buddy, Yara. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yara is in a different plaza, but seems to be active. Yeah, I'm just going to tell everybody I'm going over to... I'm going to talk to somebody. I'll be back in a minute. And you just let you see him over the rest of the crowd as he just wanders off. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Icarus runs after you and looks up and says, you look like the only other person here that might have worked a day in their life. I am not staying with those people. You all walk or run after Fida, whose, you know, boots are already tearing up the deck plates to get somewhere where he's comfortable at. It doesn't take you terribly long to get to the... We'll just say the establishment, that's a stretch, that your friend is drinking at today. It is a legitimate business. It technically has all its licenses. Technically. Yes. So this would be between the Ozone Plaza and the Spice Plaza. So you have gone the promenade walk up towards the Spice Plaza, but it's not completely inside. It's just sort of on the outskirts. For the rest of you, it's really more like two tables bar top tables that have been put together and there's like a, a cooler of sorts that maybe keeps drinks cold or has libations and refreshments. There's a man sitting on one of the stools there who's just sipping something perhaps hot and spiced and he seems to recognize Fida as he walks up. Hey. How's it going? You want the answer? Terrible as always. Mm. I can assure you things can get worse. <laughs> Yeah. He looks over your shoulder. Fida hasn't noticed until he looks and then he looks and he's like, uh, I've got a, <laughs> I got a situation. Is that what they're calling themselves? I don't know how to respond to that, so I'm not gonna. No, I got pulled down to Kua. Ooh. And a patron has been doing some fucking around and my number has come up. I need to get into the cellar, get a disc from a fella, and then get out again within the next 12 hours. I tell you, they don't care. And he just shrugs at him. He's like, Yara, I opened a fucking cryo tube and a lady turned into balls of light and disappeared. How much have you had to drink? Well, none, but I have been chewing a bit of a rash, but that's not, that's neither here nor there. All right. Cellar, eh? Yeah. I know you're a respectable kind of guy, but if you got somebody that you might know who would get me down there. I know a gambler. He's probably playing cards right now. He could definitely open the way. Any suggestions for, uh, if I gotta lean on him? He's a gambler, so he's always gonna be interested in money first. Is he a good gambler or a bad gambler? Is he the type that's always short? Nah. He comes and goes. Hmm. Alrighty. We're about any idea where he favorite water and holes there's a place here it's not far all right brother and he just g- gets up and he puts a meaty hand on yara's shoulder and he's like i'm in a real rush but uh if I get out of this one clean i'll explain it all to you and you won't believe the bullshit that's come up so far i can only imagine he sort of chuckles keep your uh keep your wits about you fuckers took my tools too he's just gonna turn and walk out muttering so you walk out muttering. Place he pointed to you to is in to take a tube, likely to get there. It is all the way over in the market plaza, which basically means it's on the other side of the station. I'm going to relay that to everybody else that followed me along and just be like, yep, yeah, my guy says there's he can lean on to get us down there, and he's over in the other side of the station. So the the cool part about how Corio Station is put together the promenade ring is basically a donut and then there's the promenade walkway that goes that interconnects all four of the different plazas right off of that promenade area there are tube stations that work essentially like a subway 
or like an, an underground metro system that will transport you around and through to those places. You can even take one that will sort of whip your way through around the plazas so that way you don't have to stop in them. Yeah, and he's just going to recommend the tube line that'll suit us best. He's going to say, do you all have your travel cards? I assume that you've all spent time on the station before. It's cheaper to have a travel card. I'm very familiar with the station and running through the station and hiding in the station. You know, like smugglers do. I haven't been to the station in a while. I'm definitely keeping my eye out for certain security members. And to be perfectly honest, transit card is in my other set of pants. Mm, well, that's tough. You're going to have to pay for yourself. It's just going to be like, well, well, too bad. Who's this guy we're going to see? He's a friend of a friend. What? Does your friend of a friend have a name? If I just makes a look at you like, why would I need to know the guy's name? I just need to know where he is, and I look for the biggest loser in the in the room. Tamaris, for you, like the idea of even having a tube card is sort of gross. Yes, just looking somewhat bemused by this idea. <laughs> well, it's really good if you do uh, anything more than two rides a day, three days a week. It's uh, it just saves money. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I would love to hear more about this in the future. Deadpan expression. Well, now, I'm not a tube engineer. They're different. I'm a ship engineer. Now, you'd be surprised at the differences, but it runs on a mag rail system. That's about as much as I can tell you. Icarus, darling, if you're worried about security, stick with me. O on, on my right. Yes. They won't be paying too much attention to you. The ride on the tube is, I would say, uneventful, but I think that cheapens the experience. The maglev trains that they have here are not perfect. And so there's a lot of jittering in some of these as you go along. Remember, you don't take a lot of straight lines. Most everything is curved here. And so that curving is not perfect. But most of you have a pretty secure stomach, so you don't really have to worry about it. For you, Icarus, riding the tube here is kind of exhilarating because it does in certain spaces actually get to speed, which is nice because otherwise around some of these bends, it kind of just, it feels like an amusement ride and that's sort of boring. And then other parts, it's like a roller coaster. For you, kind of, this is probably annoying at best. There's nothing in order here and it just feels like somebody should be fixing these things, not just letting them just exist. But you arrive at a, another bar, which isn't, well, it's got, we'll just say entertainment out front. The entertainment out front is mostly games. One might not call them gambling, but you do pay to play the games and there are chances for you to win things. But the marketeers who are out here are careful not to use the word gambling or be sort of under the ire of some of the order and other, we'll just say more hyper-religious factions who look down their noses at such things and might be willing to say set fire to the games because as we all know, fire is cleansing. But there's a big, almost frog mouth style opening to this building. And deep inside, you see that there's a, a bar with not only libations, probably smoking tobaccos and other aromatics. What a charming place. Icarus looks so much more comfortable. And bearing in mind what Vita had said, just looking for the biggest loser in the place, she just sort of looks over everything, but salmons her way through the tables and is much happier here than in the oval room she started her day in. Yeah, the great thing about this place for you, Icarus, is that it feels like real people live and work here. It isn't the cleanest place. It isn't what you would call, or anyone might call, hygienic by that means. Like, you're really sure that that bartender over there has been cleaning the bar with the same rag, likely. But it's all about the seasoning, right? And in the same way, yet in a different way, completely tamarous, this place is an, an atrocity. You should not be here as a courtesan. This does not look good on your reputation. And you are highly thankful that your choice of dress today also includes a potential hood should you need to deploy it. Oh, I've already deployed it. <laughs> the moment we cut off the tube knowing where we were going. 
As far as the biggest loser, this isn't hard for you to pick out, Amara. Much like Fida had mentioned, the biggest loser in here is probably that guy over there. We'll just say a a wafer sort of thin fellow who probably hasn't eaten a regular standard two meals a day in a couple of weeks. He seems to be picking at the table that he sits at. Everybody else there is having a good time. He, visually speaking by the chips in front of him, isn't having a good time at all. I go and grab a a drink from the bar, whatever is cheapest, and I uh, go over to the to the loser's table, pull a chair out and look at him. And, is the seat taken? Mm-hmm. He looks up from his drink and, and the table and sees you in front of him. Uh, no, no. He looks around. Everybody else at the, at the bar waiting or are people, other people coming over to engage him? I've gone up to the bar and I've gotten like a little flagon of wine. Mm-hmm. They have some very... We would just say grappa style wine here that is pretty good. It's likely made in like the back of someone's house, but man, this stuff is good. I'm surprised it's not made in the bathtub. Excellent. I'm definitely at the bar. I've asked for a drink, but water it down a little. Oh, that's easy, the bartender says. Fida leans over and he's like, Don't worry, all the drinks here are watered down. He just goes back and just drinks. Icarus has snagged a drink from the bar and sat down at another table to play whatever they're playing. Nothing high stakes, but just enough to keep an eye on Amara and a a separate enough to not clearly be a part of whatever group Amara is a part of. Okay. He looks up at you, Amara, and then asks, do I owe you money or something? No, but yeah, I could owe you money. He looks confused. What do you mean? I'm looking for some information. And I was told to find the most handsome fella in here. And that information would come from him. Well, uh, he seems to point across the bar. Vendi over there is the guy you're looking for then. He's, I mean, all the courtesans come in here and they want to spend time with him. Oh. Oh no, I want to spend time with you. Okay, what do you what do you want? That's weird. All right, let me get right down to it. I'm looking for a way to the cellar, and I was told that you shh, shh, shh. bring your voice down. I'm sorry. You want to go downstairs? Oh, I want to go downstairs. Okay. I just need you to understand it's not a it's not a nice place. Oh, well, I'm not a nice girl. All right. I can show you a pathway there. It's going to cost you, of course. He seems to brighten a little. It always costs. What's it going to cost? 500 burr. 500 burr? Keep your voice down. God, for that, I could get a really nice massage. Yeah, well, you can have a massage. You can go to the basement. He winks. Your choice. Let me confer with my crew first. Can you give me a minute? Take your time. He sits back in the bar. All right. I go to the group at the bar. feel like we're getting ripped off. He wants 500 burr. I'm not giving him all 500 burr. I can chip in 100. Well, we're in a gambling den. I'll go rack some up. There's no better way to lose burr than going into a gambling den. No, if Icarus wants to try, let her try. I don't have that much to lose, so... I like the idea of Icarus trying as well. Yeah, I'm going to hand over maybe 75. Okay, so you have 175 on the table to work with. Are you going to give the money to Icarus to help earn more money? Or are you just using that as a, this is what we have, Icarus, You then you can go earn your own? Icarus, go try and make whatever you can. I don't know. That's my, absolutely what I'm doing. Fight has only ever lost money in gambling dens. He is the guy that's like, oh, no, 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 no. You go in there to lose money and maybe have a good time. That's it. You're not doing it right. So there are several table games here. Most of them are cards. Some of them might be, I would say, a little bit more closely aligned with a roulette style game. I guess you'll have to let me know what your particular choice would be in this. Something 
That requires a little bit of skill. She doesn't want to cheat if she doesn't have to. That should be helpful to your your estimation of what's going to happen. Okay. Because she also has a five in agility. Make a run for it. Grab some money, make a run for it. It's a good idea. No, so I, I think that the way I'm going to be with the gambling in this, the way I'll rule for this is a little bit more flexible on the player end, right? So I think that the great part about what the system offers us is sort of you tell me what your approach is and then I will tell you what skill and attribute to use. Like if you were actually trying an all-out theft, then certainly it'd be agility and infiltration to quite frankly steal money from other people. If you want to play some games and try to learn the ins and outs of them and affect the outcome by your sheer amounts of, we'll just say chutzpah, then you could certainly use wits to do so. If you were the sort of person that wanted to lull someone into a bad position by attempting to distract them, entice them, or beat them in a, in a sort of manipulative game, I'd let you use empathy and manipulation. So, yeah, I guess just let me know which which of the paths that you would like to go down. Well, despite how hesitant Icarus can seem at times, I think we both know she's got some balls on her. So definitely go in the chutzpah route on there. Certainly. So the workup for this is a little bit more long form, maybe not the longest form. That would be more of the empathy manipulation route. But over the next hour or so, you sit down at several tables. You play several games just back and forth with some of the players here. Card games, five card games, seven card games to learn what you'll need to. And so I'll give you a, I'll make it a wits observation roll at first. And that will give you sort of your learning about the game. Three successes. So three successes is a critical success. So this is what I'll say you get out of it. You learn in five to seven hands, the essentials, not just from the back and forth between other players, but when you sit down at the table, you appear as a new player. And so some people also explain a few of the ins and outs of the game. What they don't understand is that they're explaining to somebody who is hyper-focusing on that particular task. And they sort of arm you with more information than you need. And so now I'll give you just a wits roll, but I'm going to give you a two dice enhancement to it from your critical success, which means you roll seven dice as your wits are five. Two successes. Okay. After an about a total of an hour with your fellow new crew members watching you on, Icarus racks up about 250 burr. Her play, as well as it is, causes several people to leave the table because she just keeps winning. But it's, it's quite an accomplishment. So at that point, Icarus is going to excuse herself because... That's a fair, that's enough for her to bring to the pot. Winning anything more than that would probably piss somebody off. But with uh, Amara's hundred and, you know, perhaps a hundred of your own or whatever else you're going to put into it, the crew is much closer than uh, they were to paying the, um, we'll just say the fee. Whoa, slow down. If she won 250 burr, that means we only each have to pay 50. I sigh and throw my hundred burr into the pot electronically, I'm assuming. Well, there there are data there are data chip cards here that you can you can pay. They're fairly simple. Most people probably have two or three to make payments to locations, and you get them back as empties. And no one handles physical money. Yeah, I'll put a hundred burr in. So that's one hundred and seventy-five with Fida seventy-five. She's going to put in the two fifty she won. She knows how this works now. She can always come back. So that's four twenty-five. Uh, I'll throw a fifty at it. And then I'll put in the 25. Right. It takes you a little over an hour, but you earn and collect 500 burr, which is pretty nice. And all the while, your contact across the way has been watching. And he genuinely seems pretty interested. I gather the, the data chips and take them over to my new friend. Toss them on the table. He collects them. It's nice work by uh, your friend there. I haven't seen these guys get so uh, grumpy at card games in a long time. You see him tap some of the chips together, and then he 
leaves three or four of them, which are likely empties on the table, and he tucks the final one into a jacket pocket. Okay. You want to go to the cellar? I'll show you the way. And he stands up from the table. And I think that's where we'll call our inaugural episode to Children of the Periphery to a close. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Children of the Periphery from the Old Ways Podcast. We greatly appreciate your listening ears. We look forward to um, exploring the depths of Coriolis Station next time.